start again. Good afternoon, everyone. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Stevenson. I wish to raise a point of order under section 4.1 and 6 of our rules on the submission of motions insofar as they apply to motion S4M 13203, the future of Scotland's economy, in the name of Jackie Bailey. And let me say at the outset that I welcome any debate, any time on both economy and education, and hope I will be called to speak in the debate later. The motion references a document apparently from the University of Edinburgh which cannot be found publicly available. I invite you to consider whether it thus may be in breach of Parliament rules on motions at 4.1, which state the text of motions should not disclose any information that is confidential. I invite you as presiding officer under rule six to consider what guidance you might give us on the matter. And for the avoidance of doubt for yourself and for colleagues in raising this matter, I do so as an individual and not as a committee convener. Thank the member for the advance notice of this point of order. And the member refers to the admissibil admissibility criteria set out in the guidance on motions. In particular, he refers to the point that the text of motions should not disclose information that is confidential. He asserts that the information referred to is confidential as it is not publicly available. In this particular case, the information is in the public domain as it was raised during FMQs last week and has also been covered in the media. The motion the motion, therefore, meets the criteria for admissibility. However, in general terms, debates are better informed where information referred to in motions is easily available to all. So that is that's the, our position. So thank you very much. And we'll now move on to portfolio questions. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And I now call on Bob Doris, question one. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it will make to the UK Government to oppose the reported additional £12 billion in benefits reductions. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, as the First Minister made clear last week, the UK Government has not set out the details of how it will achieve the £12 billion of benefit reductions proposed in the Conservative Manifesto. We do know that if Scotland takes a proportionate share of the proposed £12 billion, benefit expenditure in Scotland could be reduced by about £1 billion. We are very clear, though, that we oppose further measures that will have an impact on the vulnerable in communities across Scotland, and the member can rest assured that we will make that case strongly to the UK Government. This situation is causing anxiety and distress to many people. It is incumbent on us all in this Parliament to build alliances to argue for the protection of the vulnerable against deeper social security cuts. Thank you. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that response. Uh, David Cameron suggested long ago as 2012 that under-25s may have their housing benefit withdrawn by a future UK Conservative government. Estimates show there are over 4,500 under-25s on housing benefit in Glasgow region alone and over 28,000 across Scotland. Such cuts would inflict untold misery on young Scots and exacerbate homelessness. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that, in the first instance, the UK Government should abandon any potential plans to erode the basic human rights of young Scots to a home, and that ultimately this place, Scotland's Parliament, should make all future decisions on welfare provisions for our nation? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I do agree with Mr Doris on both points. We do know from the Tory manifesto that their proposal is to remove housing benefit from 18 to 21-year-olds, and that would affect around 7,000 young people in Scotland. We believe there is a better alternative to these austerity and cruel measures, and uh, it would be far better if this Parliament had full control over all social security matters, because we would take a much fairer and humane approach to all aspects of social security than that being taken by the UK government at Westminster. Thank you very much. Question two, Sarah Boyer. Will the cabinet secretary agree to allow, sorry, a, can I apologize, cabinet secretary, I was reading what might have Start been my again. supplementary. 
Start again, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the City of Edinburgh Council regarding the Authority's proposed local development plan. Secretary Alec Neil. The presiding officer, I'd have been happy to answer the first question. <laughs> <laughs> the Council published a proposed local development plan in 2013 and a second one in 2014. My officials have discussed both proposed plans with Council officials on a number of occasions as part of their general liaison with the Planning Authority and in specific discussions regarding the plan. Senator Byatt. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? I am aware that there have been lots of meetings, but will the Cabinet Secretary agree to take a fresh look at the plan to allow the Council to prioritise brownfield developments and empower them to stop land banking, which has seen crucial sites not brought forward for development? And will he take on board and understand the anger that many communities have, which is that land in their areas will be brought forward for development with this plan, but without the Council having the funding to invest in vital schools, in social care, and and decent transport infrastructure. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I am very, very sympathetic to the points made by Sarah Boyack. There is a great deal of brownfield land in Edinburgh, uh, and much of it actually already has received planning permission, but no development has taken place. And I think we need to get, in a city the size of Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, a better balance between development in brownfield sites and development in any greenfield sites. And the points raised by Sarah Boyack are very relevant to discussion on the local development plan in Edinburgh. And when eventually the LDP comes to us for comment and any decisions, we will be very, very conscious of the need to establish and then maintain that balance. Thank you very much. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Have you got any, has the Cabinet Secretary any... Um, um, sort of any idea as to how we can incentivise the development of brownfield sites, because that's part of the problem. There's no incentive for them to build. Cabinet Secretary. The presiding Officer, I do recognise that in a number of brownfield sites, by definition, they can be very difficult sites on occasion, although many brownfield sites are actually almost as easy to develop as greenfield sites. Uh, but I do take the member's point that in, certainly in some cases, there may be a need to incentivise developers to build on such sites I'm entirely open to any suggestions as long as it's proportionate and that public money is put to good use and provides any additionality uh, so that these sites would not be developed without additional public money in the form of incentives. But I certainly have no objection at all and every sympathy with the point the member makes is certainly in some sites there will be a need for a much closer partnership between the private and public sector to encourage the development the actual development as opposed to planning permission for the development of brownfield sites. Many thanks. I'll just say brief questions and answers will help us get through the questions. Number three, Nigel Don. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact what the impact will be on young people in Scotland of the UK's proposal to end housing benefit for people under 21. Margaret Burgess. Okay. Um, the Conservative Party election manifesto proposed that 18 to 21 year olds and job seekers allowance should no longer have an auto automatic entitlement to housing benefit. If housing benefit was to end for all people under 21 in Scotland, it would affect around 7,000 young people and take away more than £30 million a year in housing benefits payments from, for those in the age 18 to 20, to 20 group. Thanks. Nigel Don. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer and, of course, listened intently to the Cabinet Secretary's comments to Bob Doris earlier. I'm just wondering, given that we are undoubtedly agreed that it would be an extremely good idea if all this was within our control, but it isn't yet, what discussions the Minister might have had with local authorities about the implications of this for their budgets, please? Minister. Okay. At the moment, um, with local authorities, it's part of what we've been well, under discussion with COSLA and the, the Welfare Reform Group, because as the Cabinet Secretary did say, we in much of Civic Scotland make, made the case for the full devolution of Social Security to ensure that we could have a more joined up system that helped the most vulnerable, and that's what we're working to twa towards with all our stakeholders and with local government in the third sector. Thanks, Richard Simpson. Yes, can, further to that answer, can I ask the, the Minister uh, what uh, representation she has made with regard to protecting particularly vulnerable groups like looked after children, uh, those who have been subject to abuse in their family home, 
uh, where separate housing is absolutely vital no matter what age they are. Minister. I, abso I absolutely agree with the member that separate housing is vital in a number of circumstances and we've always made that case and will continue to make that case. We are determined, we are opposed to any measure to cut uh, housing benefit from young people and will continue with that and hope that we'll get the support from others across this chamber to do that. And it certainly is something that we're actively looking at in our discussions um, with the third sector partners and with our local authority partners. We recognise very much the issues raised by Richard Simpson. Many thanks. A question four in the name of Christian Allard has not been lodged and a less than satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question five, Jackson Carlaw. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to devolve powers to local communities. Uh, Minister Marco Biaggi. The Community Empowerment Scotland Bill will deliver significant new rights and powers for communities across Scotland. We want to empower communities through the ownership of land and buildings and strengthen their voices in the decisions that matter to them. However, we are always open to discuss new approaches, such as the groundbreaking discussions of the island area's ministerial working group that culminated in our prospectus for the islands. There is no single solution or magic bullet to empowerment, and I welcome the interest and thoughts of all others around the chamber. Thanks, Jackson Carlo. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that interesting reply? Many believe that local communities should have a legal Scottish community right to challenge, giving community and voluntary bodies the right to express interest in taking over a particular council run service. A local authority would be required to respond, and unless there were reasonable grounds for refusal, run a procurement process. This community right to challenge could see real power being devolved down to those who live and breathe those services within their local community. Will the Scottish Government consider uh, material and substantive de devolution to local communities such as this? Minister. Well, I can uh, extend some warm words to Jackson Carlow on some good news that the Community Empowerment Bill will introduce participation requests, which are a great deal more flexible than the community right to challenge, allowing communities to choose the degree of involvement they want to have in improving a public service. And uh, unlike the right to challenge, however, participation requests will not open up local services to privatisation, forcing communities to bid against huge outsourcing companies. Thanks. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. One of the powers that uh, is devolved to local authorities is that to, to charge for social care. Uh, Scotland Against the Care Tax would like the government to use its power to abolish care charges altogether, but the government has responded that it would prefer to work with local authorities. Can I ask what progress has been made? As far as I can understand, no progress has been made at all about either introducing equity or towards abolition. Can the Minister update us on what progress has been made in abolishing care charges? Minister. Discussions are ongoing and have been led by my colleague Shona Robison, who I'm sure would be very happy to write to the member to update him on uh, work in progress. Thank you very much. Question six, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to, ask what, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to the UK Government concerning the Human Rights Act. Secretary Alec Neil. Presenting officer, on Friday I wrote to Michael Gove, the new Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, to reiterate the Scottish Government's opposition to the repeal of the Human Rights Act. The First Minister also raised the matter directly with the Prime Minister when they met last Friday. I sought an early meeting with Mr Gove to further underline our concerns. Those concerns I know are shared by the overwhelming majority of members in this chamber as shown by the vote last November. Last week, I undertook to keep the Parliament informed of the progress of these discussions, and I'm happy to reiterate that undertaking today. The UK Government's programme for the first session of the new UK Parliament will be set out in the Queen's speech on the 27th of May. My colleague, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, will update the Scottish Parliament on the legislative consent implications of the Queen's speech in due course. Thank you. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm very grateful that he has uh, expressed the abhorrence of this Parliament for what is proposed. But in his letter, did he specifically raise the issue uh, of uh, the necessity of a legislative consent motion, which clearly will not be approved uh, by this Parliament? Is it not the case that what is proposed drives a coach and horses through the Scotland Act, uh, as well as uh, putting the UK potentially outside the family of nations committed to universal human rights? Presiding officer, uh, the repeal of the Human Rights Act and the uh, withdrawal from the European Convention on Human Rights has potentially huge implications, not just for the Scotland Act, but for the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland as well. 
and we have made it absolutely clear that there will be no cooperation from this government in the repeal of the Human Rights Act. We believe it's a very regressive and reactionary measure and entirely the wrong thing to do. And if the opportunity arises for us to frustrate the passage of such legislation in any way whatsoever, I'm sure the, most of the Parliament will be united in exploiting any such opportunities to the full. Many thanks. Question 7, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact on disabled people in Scotland of the Department for Work and Pensions proposal to cap the Access to Work scheme. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, the Scottish Government has sought urgent assurances from the Department of Work and Pensions on how its intention to cap support available through the Access to Work scheme will impact disabled people in Scotland. DWP estimate based on current delivery is that the number of individuals likely to be affected in Scotland is small, but we are continuing to work with DWP to better understand the future impact of these changes in Scotland and to press for assurances that those affected receive the support they require. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Minister for her response and I'm very pleased that the matter is being given further consideration because the Access to Work scheme is a real success in the support it provides for disabled people to access and sustain employment. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary therefore what action the Scottish Government itself is taking to support disabled people in accessing employment? Uh, well, uh, we are taking a number of different uh, actions and that will include the delivery of developing Scotland's young workforce, uh, which has already been debated in the Chamber. Um, outcomes from Community Jobs Scotland that are specifically for vulnerable groups uh, and in improving the uptake of modern apprenticeships by disabled people which we also discussed last week and in fact in that regard uh, we've committed uh, half a million pounds to delivering an equalities action plan which will be published in autumn 2015 which will contain within its specific improvement targets for, amongst others, uh, those who are disabled. Um, we're also promoting, uh, promoting and supporting the uh, supported employment framework uh, and are working closely with partners, including local authorities, in order to support them to develop and deliver this model locally. And, of course, as well as that, we also see supported businesses as one small but important part of the overall support available to disabled people. Many thanks. Question 8, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce child poverty in West Scotland. Minister Margaret Burgess. We take a national approach to, to tackling the long-term drivers of poverty through early intervention and prevention. Our commitment to building a fairer Scotland and tackling inequality is one of three key themes of the programme for government. As part of that programme, we are further promoting the living wage across all sectors delivering on our commitment to 600 hours free childcare for three- and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds, and are providing around £296 million from 2013-14 to 2015-16 to help those affected by the UK government's welfare reforms. And over the lifetime of this parliament, we are also investing over £1.7 billion in affordable housing. Many thanks. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that response? And can the Minister tell me if she's read Renfrewshire Council's report on tackling poverty in Renfrewshire? And further tell me what specific action the Scottish Government will take on the recommendation calling on them to allocate school resources to reflect levels of deprivation and specifically link those resources to closing the attainment gap and ensuring more pupils from low income achieve positive destinations? Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to raising attainment in education and has recently put funding into that, that very purpose to encourage those from disadvantaged areas um, to, to get access to education, uh, and that has been recently uh, an announcement made. We also put tackling poverty and inequality at the heart of government through policies like we have in council tax frees, free prescriptions, um, working with local authorities, the NHS and others to tackle child poverty. We also have our Child Poverty Annual Report, um, which highlights the, the work that's been undertaken by local government, the third sector and business, which includes the introduction of a full measurement framework, which will provide an overview of the current position on key outcomes against which progress will be measured in future annual reports. We'll also, uh, the government is committed to appointing an independent advisor on poverty and inequality, reporting directly to the First Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to portfolio questions on fair work, skills and training. Question one, Cameron Buchanan. 
Thank you. To ask the presiding, sorry, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase the number of apprenticeships in woodwork. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, the modern apprenticeship programme program is driven by the demand of employers rather than by government. We are, however, committed to expanding the number of MA opportunities each year to 30,000 by 2020. Additional MAs, including more higher level and STEM opportunities, will help create a competitive and dynamic business environment to support sustainable economic growth and higher quality jobs. As far as woodwork specifically is concerned, I can say to the member that there are already a number of ME uh, frameworks that include woodwork, including ones in construction, in wood and timber, and in furniture, furnishings and interiors. The number of starts on these frameworks has risen significantly from 61 in 2012-13 to over 1,300 in 2014-15. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan. I thank the Minister for her response. And what is the Scottish Government doing to encourage the combination of business acumen with skills training in modern apprenticeships? Minister? Um, well, our modern apprenticeship programme, we work closely with uh, a, a number of, of sectors. As I, as I said in my initial response, presiding officer, the, the modern apprenticeship programme is driven by the demand of employers. So, of course, we work uh, closely with business uh, to ensure that the modern apprenticeship programme meets uh, their needs, as well as the needs of the young people who learn the vital skills that they need to make their way in life, whilst at the same time crucially earning a wage. Many thanks. Question two, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to address skill shortages in key industries of economic growth. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Through the development of sectoral skills investment plans and regional skills assessments, we committed to delivering demand-led skills provision to meet the skills needs, key industries and the wider Scottish economy. Uh, developed by SDS in conjunction with industry bodies, these plans provide a framework for businesses and employers to articulate the right skills needed to support the development of Scotland's growth sectors. And the SIPs have been developed to identify and respond to uh, the skills priorities that are required to support the industrial sectors in achieving their growth potential. During 2013-14, there were 25,284 modern apprenticeship starts with over 70 different occupational frameworks available. And in delivering that programme, the Scottish Government directs Skills Development Scotland to prioritise places on frameworks relating to government economic strategy growth sectors. Thank you. Alex Ferguson. Well, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but she'll be aware that a number of industries, including construction and STEM professions, have recently warned of the looming skills shortage which threatens their economic growth. She's mentioned modern apprentices, and of course they offer a great opportunity to, to earn as you learn and to train Scotland's young people with the skills they need for sustainable employment. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps the Scottish Government can take to more effectively match apprenticeship opportunities with the industries that are, are, are identified as being most in need of additional skilled employees? Um, I, I, I think, as the member will have heard from my colleague, uh, people need to uh, keep in their minds that the, the apprenticeship programme is effectively employer-led. We, we don't create the jobs, it's the employers who create the jobs and then we provide the means by which they can become uh, uh, modern apprenticeships. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the member has raised a number of sectors with whom he, I hope, will be glad to know uh, I've already had close uh, conversation. That includes the construction uh, 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 sector and I've visited the National Construction College uh, during the Easter recess. I've discussed the issue about uh, uh, road haulage with the, uh, the, the newly formed group there uh, and we are all aware of the challenges in the digital skills uh, uh, area as well. These, these are areas with which we continue to have a dialogue with employers, but we do rely enormously on this, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the trade bodies themselves to flag up potential shortages so that instead of having to work uh, reactively, we can begin to work more proactively. Many thanks. Question three, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking under the Fair Work Skills and Training Portfolio to support the Fife economy. Minister Annabel Ewing. The Scottish Government is committed to the economic development of Fife and is using all levers at our disposal to maximise investment, to support economic growth and to create jobs. The Fair Work Skills and Training Portfolio provides for significant support to, for example, young people in Fife through the Employability Fund, through Opportunities for All, through the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, 
through the developing the young workforce uh, and other uh, uh, initiatives. In addition, the Scottish Government has demonstrated its commitment to economic development in Fife through its support of Fife's, Fife Council's delivery of the Business Gateway Service and, of course, to Scottish Enterprise. Uh, I would also say to the member, as I know that she will be well aware, uh, that we have the ongoing work of the recently established Joint Task Force to which we have committed an initial £6 million. Many thanks. Claire Baker. Uh, the Minister, in her reply, acknowledged the situation at Tillis Russell and the redundancy issues being faced by many workers there. And I also welcome the task force report that was published last week from the Scottish Government and Fife Council. Um, part of the plan is £100,000 for immediate training needs, followed by half a million pounds for further skills development and training. Um, the Minister talked about what we're providing for young people. Most of the workforce at Tillis Russell are aged over 40. And what will the Minister do in her role to ensure that there are appropriate training and um, skills opportunities for the more mature, mature and experienced workforce. Um, I, I thank the, the member for her, for her supplementary and I know that she takes a keen interest, as we all do, uh, uh, representing Fife in, in the work of the Joint Task Force and we wish it all success. In terms of the uh, spending that uh, recently was announced, in terms of the uh, uh, initial sums of 100,000 to respond to people's immediate training needs and a further 500,000 pounds for skills development and training in the short term, um, I would say that I would be working closely uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Enterprise Minister uh, and, of course, with Fife Council to ensure that we uh, see that money being spent absolutely where it is needed most. And I can give that assurance to the member that that is how we intend uh, to proceed. Many thanks. Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just in relation to the Fife Task Force, can the Minister uh, confirm or is she happy that the amount of money allocated for the uh, immediate training needs is going to be adequate? And can it be reviewed if it proves to be inadequate? Uh, I, I would say to the member that these, uh, uh, the decisions taken at the task force uh, last uh, uh, Thursday uh, were uh, stated to be uh, initial responses uh, and therefore it is the work of the task force that will uh, direct the progress based on how we are dealing with the challenges on the ground. But uh, I uh, am sure that the uh, Minister for Enterprise will keep uh, the, the member and others uh, fully informed of the important work of the task force. And I know that all members across the chamber, across parties, wish the task force all success. Many thanks. Question for Ian Gray. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what support it will provide for East Lothian Council to increase employment opportunities for young people. Mr Annabel Ewing. East Lothian Council will benefit from the wide range of Scottish Government funded programmes and services. Uh, young people in East Lothian uh, uh, will continue to have access to our expanding modern apprenticeship programme. Of course, there's the Educational Maintenance Allowance, Activity Agreements, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, Community Jobs Scotland, to name but some. In March of this year, we uh, uh, allocated to local authorities notification Rather, we made notification to local authorities of their share of the £6.5 million funding in 1415 to support implementation of the Developing Young Workforce Programme. Uh, in partnership with educational institutions and other agencies, East Lothian is preparing an implementation plan to continue to reduce youth unemployment in the area. Uh, the, minister is, uh, the Minister is absolutely right that <clears throat> the local council have prepared an implementation plan uh, for the their share their uh, element of the government's developing the young workforce strategy and they have a good track record in these areas not least projects such as the East Lothian Hospitality and Tourism Academy which has uh, become uh, uh, well known uh, for providing opportunities for young people but I did want to ask specifically what financial support the council will receive uh, in carrying out their share of this government plan after all uh, the government have required them to find £11 million worth of cuts uh, in the next three years. Minister? Um, uh, in terms of the allocation for 1415 under the Developing Young Workforce, if, if I wasn't quite clear if that was what the member was getting at, that figure is £125,349. In terms of the allocation for 1516, I understand that these issues are currently under discussion. In terms of uh, local authority funding, uh, we uh, have to work with, uh, within the confines of the Scottish Budget, which of course is set first of this institution. Thank you. Question 5, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Department for Work and Pensions report, Equality Analysis for the Future of Access to Work. 
Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, I believe the member was in the chamber when I answered uh, this uh, similar question from uh, Jackie Bailey uh, in the previous portfolio questions uh, and I can reassure him that we are continuing to work with the DWP to better understand the future impact of the changes uh, and to press for assurances that those affected do receive the support they require. Many thanks. Graham Day. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The report outlines that 89.5% of those affected by the proposed capping of awards at £40,800 would be deaf or suffering from some degree of hearing loss. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that in light of this acknowledged consequence, the planned approach not only does not square with the Conservatives' manifesto commitment to bring hundreds of thousands of disabled people into work, they are in fact knowingly going to exclude a specific disability group from gaining meaningful employment? Well, uh, we are concerned about the impact the cap may have on those who are deaf or have hearing loss because of the numbers who do uh, benefit from it. We are committed to supporting the deaf community in Scotland and do fully recognise the importance of British Sign Language as a vital means of communication to help people both find and stay in work. Uh, in general terms, the Scottish Centre for Healthy Working Lives can offer advice to employers on how to make reasonable workplace adjustments to accommodate employees with disabilities and can signpost people to organisations that can give more specific advice on particular disabilities and conditions. But, of course, that does require uh, assistance of the kind that has been uh, hitherto available through access to work, and it is a concern if that is now going to be cut, uh, particularly if there's a differential impact on one very particular group of the disabled. Many thanks. Question six, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to identify the skills that will be needed by the future workforce. Yes, Secretary. Through the development of sectoral skills investment plans and regional skills uh, in assessments, we are committed to delivering demand-led skills provision to meet the needs of local labour markets and the wider Scottish economy. Uh, developed by SDS in con conjunction with industry bodies, the plans do provide a framework for businesses and employers to articulate the right skills needed to support the development of Scotland's growth sectors. And the SIPs have been developed to identify and respond to the skills priorities that are required to support the industrial sectors in achieving their growth potential. Many thanks. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I note that the Minister for Youth and Women's Employment earlier this year visited Fife College's Stenton campus to learn about their engineering pathfinder in Fife. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that such partnership working involving schools and employers is an excellent way of meeting the needs of young people and local businesses? And what steps will the Government take to encourage this approach across Scotland? Well, that was a pilot project in respect of foundation apprenticeships, which we are now going to be rolling out. And there's been a considerable uh, financial announcement made just earlier this week of £3.8 million to uh, uh, provide further 500 uh, MA places. Uh, and as well as higher level apprenticeships, that's going to focus on foundation apprenticeships as well. The particular visit that the uh, member is referring to, um, I, I heard about in detail uh, from my colleague, and indeed I'm using one of the anecdotes that she came back with uh, as something that I uh, repeat quite often, because it does seem to have been extraordinarily successful, although there weren't perhaps quite as many young girls involved that we might otherwise have wished to see However, there was a lesson to be learned about the school that did uh, turn up with a, a, a number of young women, uh, and that is something that we do want to uh, keep an eye on. Many thanks. Question seven, Roderick Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government how it can assist former members of the armed services in training for a new career. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, the Scottish Government is determined to provide the highest possible support and opportunities for our veterans and we recognise that many veterans do require additional support to enter work after leaving uh, the armed forces. Early entry to the Scottish Government funded pro uh, projects is available to veterans who are also able to take advantage of initiatives such as Community Jobs Scotland and the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. The recent uh, Transition in Scotland report from Eric Fraser, Scotland's Veterans Commissioner, commented that opportunities for veterans should be promoted to demonstrate the skills, experience and resilience that veterans bring to our communities and in the workplace. We will work with the Commissioner to identify what further action might be taken to support uh, uh, this group. Thanks. I, th Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer, but given that a recent survey by Poppy Scotland found that 37% of veterans said the problems they encountered seeking civilian employment were due to a lack of relevant training or skills, what more can be done to maximise the relevant training opportunities? 
Minister. Um, the, uh, in fact, the, the member will likely be aware that the ministerial lead for Armed Forces and Veterans Issues is, is the Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown, and I know that he uh, continues to engage with the Ministry of Defence to ensure that transitional support offered to service personnel is consistent with the approach that we are seeking to develop in Scotland. In the Veterans Commissioner's uh, uh, Commissioner's report, um, he did identify a number of areas where further work could be done to enhance support for service leavers and helping to prepare them for the civilian jobs market. In particular, the report identified the need for a comprehensive look at the policies and support available in Scotland for opening access to further and higher education for service leavers of all ages. It also highlighted opportunities for further development using examples such as the learning partnership piloted by Glasgow Caledonian University with the Armed Forces, the, the, the Three City Colleges and Glasgow's Helping Heroes. The Commissioner is now looking at the ways in which the further and higher education sectors in Scotland can provide more support for service leavers and for veterans. Many thanks, Dr Richard Simpson. And I welcome the Minister's comments on it, and particularly in relation to support to moving towards employment. Um, and I wonder if she would agree to have discussions both with the Veterans Minister Keith Brown and with Shona Robson about screening of veterans coming out of uh, the, the forces, particularly after having been engaged in uh, actual conflict, uh, because many of them actually have unrecognised uh, health problems, which are a barrier to their achieving uh, effective employment. I, I thank the, the member for his question. As a former active member of the cross-party group on veterans, I am aware of that issue and I will be happy to raise that both with uh, Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown and Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson and seek a meeting. Uh, I also, for the, the member's information, ha had already put in motion, although the process of government doesn't always work quickly, a request to meet with the Veterans Commissioner on the subject of his report as far as it impacts on this portfolio. Excellent. Question 8. Neil Bibby to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to meet skills needs in West Scotland. Secretary Rosanna um, Cunningham. There are a number of programmes in place to develop the skills and employability of people in the West of Scotland, including our expanding modern apprenticeship programme, the Employability Fund, Community Jobs Scotland, uh, and that's alongside provision available through uh, regional colleges and, of course, university education. Through the development of sectoral skills investment plans and regional skills assessments, uh, which for the west of Scotland included specific reports on Glasgow, Glasgow and Clyde Valley and Ayrshire, we committed to delivering demand-led skills provision to meet the needs of local labour markets uh, and the wider Scottish economy. Thanks. Neil Bibbitt. Cabinet, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that many people need flexibility in order to balance training or retraining with employment and childcare requirements. Can I therefore ask the Minister why the recent Audit Scotland report found that there had been a 48% reduction in the number of part-time students going to college since 2008-2009. And given that there has also been a 41% drop in the number of over 25s going to college over the same period, why is this government happy to slam the college door on so many people who want to train or retrain? Cabinet Secretary. Well, isn't it interesting that we're just hearing the same old, same old from uh, Labour? And I think that's rather unfortunate. We have said... Uh, frequently in this chamber that uh, in 2013-14 there, uh, there was an increase of 3% over the year in SFE, SFC funded uh, full-time equivalents. Uh, um, I, I've got, there, are, there, are a, there are a number of uh, uh, different things that can be said, not least of which the work that's being done with colleges is to ensure that the studies that are undertaken are actually studies which will direct people towards work. The, the courses that uh, are no longer uh, being funded are those which were not leading to employment provision. And I would have expected Labour to have wanted to support anything which was directing people into courses that would actually lead to employment uh, when they came out uh, of college, uh, instead of this constant refrain, which is actually achieving absolutely nothing. Thanks. Question 9 in the name of Jim Eady has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation provided. Question 10, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will, is encouraging more women to take up engineering roles in the renewable energy sector. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, we recognise that women are underrepresented in the renewable uh, energy sector and that includes uh, in engineering roles. We are taking action across a number of fronts to improve the situation such as the recently announced £500,000 to develop and deliver a modern apprenticeship equalities uh, action plan. 
Uh, this will include improvement targets for addressing gender imbalance. We also commissioned a full equalities impact assessment on the renewables route map. Uh, this will be published shortly as part of the route map update. Okay, thanks, Rob Gibson. The Minister for that detailed answer. I think the Minister would hopefully welcome the conclusions of a piece of work by a recent intern of mine, Lucy Moore, on women in Scottish renewables breaking down the barriers to success. And I wonder if the Minister would also come to my constituency at some point and see the work of SSE, which is one of the leading firms in the renewable industry that could employ more women. Minister. Um, I was indeed pleased to receive a copy of the research project carried out by Lucy Moore, the former intern of the member, and I have in fact raised a number of points made in that report with officials, uh, and those points are currently being considered. There is, of course, uh, uh, more work to be done to encourage more women into the renewable sector, and in this regard, the member may be interested to note that I am to meet in a few weeks with representative of the WIRES organisation, that is uh, Women in Renewable Energy Scotland. I wish to discuss with them how we can make further progress in encouraging women both to get a job in the renewable sector, but also, crucially, to actually secure career progression in that sector. And I would also say to, to the member presiding officer that I would be delighted to visit his constituency and to see the good work that SSE is doing uh, in this regard. Very good. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions, and we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13203 in the name of Jackie Bailey on the future.